wild children. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are again, these are the so called wild children, you know, the wild boy of Aveyron was the famous example. Uh, what were called children were supposed to be raised by wolves or something. Uh, the past, stuff from the past, you really don't know how to evaluate very well. Uh, there were, you don't know what the history of the children was, okay? Uh, there are modern cases that have, contemporary cases that have been studied carefully, like the one in Los Angeles, uh, Jeannie, who was a kid who was, uh, had, you know, kind of psychotic parents, father at least, who locked her in a room at around age two, I think, uh, and she never got out and never spoke to her, he just grunted at her, you know threw food at her, that sort of thing. She may have heard some noises coming from the window or somewhere or other, nobody knows, but basically she had no human experiences, you know, no linguistic experiences. She was found by, I think, a social worker or something when she was around, I think, around 13 or so, and of course immediately taken out, you know, put under care and so on. Uh, and one of the things that was done was uh, some of her caretakers were, in fact, uh, psychologists and linguists and they try to take care of her, teach her as much as they could and bring her into the world as much as they could, but also to investigate what was going on. So what could she acquire and what couldn't she acquire and what did she already know without any experience and so on. And there's a lot of work on this. Unfortunately, it's not clear what it tells you because naturally Jeannie is completely psychotic. You know? I mean, nobody could go through an experience like that and be anything like a normal human being. So you don't know how much of what you're finding is just, you know, massive damage. Again, like hitting a computer with a crowbar, uh, and how much is really specific to these various faculties and the ways they develop. This is uh, again one of those natural experiments, uh, and uh, I mean, there's some this interesting work. Uh, Susan uh, Curtis. Susan Curtis did the most serious work on this. She's book and a lot of papers, uh, and it you know, tells you what could be discovered. But uh, some grossly speaking, it turned out that she was, very, she was quite intelligent. She could do all sorts of things. And she was also apparently quite you know, appealing. She knew how to manipulate people and uh, uh, get them to do things and so on. Uh, and uh, at first they thought she was getting understanding language, but it turns out she was just using her intelligence and you know, coquettish skills and various other things to make people think she was doing it. And when they investigated more seriously, she couldn't really do anything much with language. Uh, on the other hand, she had lots of other rich conceptual structure. You know, like she understood all sorts of, immediately without any experience right in the hospital, solving complicated conceptual problems and so on. Uh, but uh, you hardly know what this means. Uh, because any defect that was found, you don't know whether to attribute it to uh, late development of language, delayed development of language, or to general psychosis. Unfortunately, uh, it ends up as a very sad story. She ended up being kind of a vegetable you know, through various maltreatment and so on. And there are a few other cases like that. Uh, there are some cases which aren't that, you know, which are less horrifying. Uh, which are very instructive. So a couple of years ago, uh, some uh, psychologists in Philadelphia, students of Lila Gleitman, who's very one of the leading cognitive psychologists, uh, they discovered uh, children. At, uh, up until fairly recently, it was assumed that deaf children didn't have any language. It's now known that that's totally false, that the language of the deaf is very much like ordinary language, just a different modality, but has a lot of the same properties and develops the same way. And so it's just another language, like Swahili, uh, uses a different modality. Uh, they discovered a couple of kids, cousins, uh, who had been brought up in what's called an oralist tradition, fortunately mostly dead, but it was the orthodoxy for a long time. The orthodoxy was that if kids are hearing disabled, you shouldn't allow them to learn sign language you should force them to lip read. Uh, it's a little bit like saying you should force kids to learn English, whatever the language is. Uh, the, uh, and that was very damaging. 
uh, it prevented normal mental and intellectual and linguistic development. That's all gone, for, mostly gone by now, unfortunately. Anyhow, these kids were brought up in this oralist tradition. Their parents had been heavily indoctrinated not to teach them sign. Her parents were speaking non, you know, had uh, spoken language. Uh, in fact, the parents were uh, t told by the, you know, therapists and so on not to even gesture to the kids. So you know, walk around like this, so that they don't get any gestures. Uh, so they're forced to do lip reading. Uh, and this had gone on for a couple of years. The kids were like three or four when they found them. But they played together, you know. And it turns out that they had invented their own language uh, with zero evidence, you know. This is a case, this is a perfect, almost perfect experiment. They had, had no input. They had just created their own language, a sign language. And it turned out to be at approximately, approximately the character of normal language development. You know, you take kids of the same age in a normal environment, that's about, they'd be doing about the same thing. Uh, you know, same structure, same complexity, and so on and so forth. Well, okay, the experiment, of course, was ended as soon as they found the kids. Then they just taught them American Sign Language. But uh, uh, there are a couple of cases like that. Uh, there's one really interesting case, which is being investigated right now, actually, in part by a former student of at MIT. Uh, they found in Nicaragua uh, a community of non, of people who are seriously hearing disabled, who had just over time had created their own language. And it's now just the language that kids learn as they grow up, and it's the language that's used, and so on. Uh, but again, with no input. Uh, so it just develops. You know. And that's a, kind of a natural case. Uh, there are other things like that, so-called creoles, that have some of the same properties, languages that are created you know, by for example, in slave communities where you bring people together from many different linguistic groups and they're sort of stuck together. Uh, they t tend rather quickly, in fact, to create a common language called Creoles. Uh, and these are just like ordinary languages as far as anybody knows. Uh, and the way in which they're constructed, you know, does tell you something about uh, the essential nature of language, just as these, uh, uh, these other cases do, including the so-called, you know, wild children, but uh, those are, you know, re I mean, hard, uh, they're restricted in what you can learn from them because of the complexity of the conditions of, in which they've developed. 